Hi, this is Eric Martin from Board Game Geek. I'm here with Melissa Rogerson, famed blogger, sometimes BGG queen. <laughs> we try, we try. Occasional bit of everything. Yes. Now, uh, I saw recently you did a presentation of some research material that was related to games. And I don't know what that was. Okay. All I saw was you were like in front of a board or oh, something. Right. I'm not sure what it was. Yeah. So, so maybe you can talk about it. I am writing up my PhD mm -hmm. um, where I've been researching the experience of playing board games. Okay. So I've come from a background in computer human interaction and understanding how people interact with, uh, with computer systems. Okay. And um, for my research for the last three years or so, I've actually been looking at how people interact with board games. Um, so maybe interact in what way? Yeah, so what that happens that when people play a board game? Um, when I started this research, I thought that I was going to be looking at what happened to board games when they were turned into, into digital games. So when we played a game on a phone, you know, was that the same experience or a different experience than when we played a game on the table. Okay. And uh, I wanted to look at what other people had written about that because of course that's what we do when we do research and I found that people hadn't really written about what we do when we play board games. Okay. So my research kind of moved from looking at digital games to looking at what happens when we sit around the table and, and play games. Okay. That is not uncommon with research. You know, things shift over time. So what how did you go about the research and I, I, even when you talk about saying how people interact with games, so how are you qualifying interactions? Yeah, so um, I started off doing some, uh, having a bit of a look at digital games from the perspective of the games. So what happens to Puerto Rico when it's turned into a digital game, for instance. Okay. And that was really cool because I looked at um, I looked at Puerto Rico, I looked at Agricola, and I looked at Ascension okay. uh, with the three games. And of course, in the case of Puerto Rico, there's the Puerto Rico spreadsheet, which you might remember, um, which you know I just think is marvelous that you can sit there and look like you're using a <laughs> spreadsheet and be playing Puerto Rico. I think that's fantastic. So we looked at kind of, do they want the games to look like the original game? Um, is it important that the game behaves in the same way as the original game? And what are people doing with these digital games that they maybe couldn't do with the um, with the traditional cardboard game? Right. And one of the things that we found there was the importance of what in digital gaming they call theory crafting, which is about throwing lots of, um, getting lots of data and trying to work out what's going on in the underlying engine. Okay. Um, and that was particularly interesting in Agricola, where most people haven't played 300 plays of Agricola <laughs> and kept detailed stats on their scores and on what cards were built. But when you look at the data from a website like playagricola.com, you can get that. Right. Similarly with Puerto Rico, you can actually look at the numbers and say, well, the I want to say the small indigo plant is built by 75% of winning players and the university is built by 3% of winning players and you can actually then take that back to the tabletop games and use the information that you've learned from playing okay. it on digital games. Which some people have done when you look at history, they would talk about Monopoly with like you have to buy these particular properties, That's avoid this right. and these pay off and so on and so on. But yeah. of course that has more like a 70, 80 year history of material on which to draw. That's right, and it's it's quite. I find it quite interesting because it's taking that um, what I personally enjoy about a game, which is that gut feel, that subjective. I reckon this card's going to be better than this card, but I'm not sure. And it sort of puts numbers around it. Okay. Um, so then I did some really long interviews with some gamers. Um, a lot of them recruited through BGG to talk about what they enjoy about board gaming, um, and. From that, I've got so much material. You know, gamers are such fun to talk to, and and people, anyone who's talking about their passion really has so much to say. Um, so I really love that part of my research. Um, then the third part, I actually watched people play games. So I invited people to come in and play. Can we stop. I think we're good. Um, stop. Well, now we stop. Now we've come to a full no. stop. Stop. So we'll yeah. So we'll start with third.
Yeah. Usually we don't have this many announcements. Or, I mean, this year is relatively quiet. So the third study that I did, I actually got people to come into our lab and I watched them playing games. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, you know, a two-way mirror so I could feel like I was in every <laughs> cop show ever. And uh, we also have a pair of glasses that track your gaze so I could actually see where somebody was looking in real time while they were playing the game. Okay. I've, I've seen other studies on those. Those are, you don't necessarily want to know, like, how these people do. Well, one do of things. the things... They see marketing studies and what are you actually looking at oh, ads and all that type of stuff. It's nuts. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things there that was really interesting was that people's gaze behavior doesn't seem to change a lot when it's their turn or when it's not their turn. So even if, you know, if we're playing a game, you're taking your turn, I'm still looking at the same kinds of things planning my next turn, trying to work out what you're doing. Right. Um, the other thing that we found when we watch people play, which I just love, so I, I really love the whole kind of touching the pieces and, and the way that people feel passionately about the pieces, um, is also uh, the way that people sort and order their pieces. So if you watch people playing a game, they're always moving their pieces around, they're ordering them differently. and everybody's got their own unique way that they do that yeah that's right as the game progresses and yeah. put things and out are you planning something you know we we ran a session of concordia and one of the players had kind of a brick and a cloth and a little pile of five money above it and so it was really obvious that he was planning <laughs> to build a cloth city um, as soon as he could so. okay I'm looking for those tells yeah. that's what you're doing here. yeah Okay. Yeah. So we'll go what, what next? So okay. I'm writing my thesis. Okay. That's uh, that's a challenge, you know, that's that's gonna take a couple more months. Mm. Um, and and then I'll be looking for obviously looking for work in academia. Um, ideally in Melbourne, my Australian university. <laughs> um, and and I've got some ideas of where I want to go next. One little piece of research that I started that I think is just fantastic was looking at shelfies and the way that people kind of share their shelfies and curate their shelfies and have their shelfies kind of over time. Um, okay. But also that, that attachment that we have to games. So um, last time I was in Essen, I played a game with some friends and I'm never going to sell that game because it means so much to me, not because of the fantastic gameplay, not because of it, I don't know, being signed by the designer, but right. because of the memories that I've associated with that game. And so looking at the different reasons why people value games that are in their collection. Right. That makes sense. I mean, that's something that sort of ties in, I would think, as well, to why Pandemic Legacy went so well with people, is because I know I'm playing this a long time, so of course I'm going to choose to play it with people I love to play with, and that just facilitates good memories because I love these guys already, yeah. and now we're doing this all. We have this awesome experience with this very particular game, and the stories that like, people have of hanging their pandemic legacy map on the wall after they've finished the yeah. game, or putting it away in the box. But even though it's kind of finished, they're not going to throw away that box with the finished game in it, they're going to keep it because there's so many great memories that yeah. are associated with that box. Yeah, so, I think yeah. so. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa, thank for coming you. out and talking. Nice cool. to see you. It's been a while yeah. since you've been here. Well, it's, it's been uh, eight years. Oh, my God. So, so. I don't know. Exactly. Did we oh pronounce it that way? I would usually say, oh, my God, Essen. Yes. But right. I get a bit excited about Hashtag it. Hashtag OMG Essen. Always. We all track once down. <laughs> Thanks very much, Eric. Yeah. <laughs>